Okay. This meeting is being recorded. So everyone here in attendance, you have been warned. <laughs> uh, anything you say will be used against you. Okay. So um, we're going to dispense with the introductions. Uh, well, okay, I guess we're not. Hi, I'm your speaker tonight, Al Giuseppe. I am the GIS manager here at the Geological Survey and also HAG's president. Uh, so what I want to talk to you guys about is shameless plugs for what the survey is up to and some of the things that we're doing. And, we, you know, at the HAGS meeting, we try to pepper in some of our projects. We, we heard from Adam not too long ago. Uh, Ellen gave a presentation here at HAGS. You know, we want to we wanna use this as a forum to showcase some of the good work that we're doing. Uh, but since no one stepped up to show their good work, I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll make something up. So I'm up here to talk about some of the, the new directions that we want to take the survey and, and some what I think are fun things. So it bears noting that we are in the next generation of the geologic survey. Uh, there has been a profound number of retirees recently. We've, we've crested on our gray wave. And uh, uh, Gail, what's the statistics? Since, since this time three years ago, what percentage? More than half. Yeah, so we are a new geologic survey. And uh, so being part of a beneficiary of that gray wave, um, <laughs> I want to share with you some of the things that I find interesting and want to talk about, which are not necessarily traditional field geology things, but more on the lines of data. And, and, and data is, is fascinating on many, many levels. One, I'm old enough to remember that we didn't always pronounce it data. You know, there was data and it was data. And then we were about half and half mixed until Patrick Stewart, when reading the script for Star Trek, said, hey, how do I pronounce this character's name? You know, well, pronounce it any way you want. And it became data. And have you noticed that since then, that is the predominant pronunciation of that word. So we have Patrick Stewart. <laughs> but what are we really going to talk about? So three things I want to share with you guys. And that is... We've recently made our first attempt at a statewide digital bedrock elevation model. Uh, also dabbling, dabbling in some landside susceptibility analysis. And also want to talk about one of my favorite topics, 3D geologic modeling. So laying the course, we're gonna, you're actually gonna get three for one here. Three presentations for the price of one. Uh, you guys are good until like 9.15, right? <laughs> so we're going to start with bedrock elevation model. And this is part of the U.S. Geo Framework Initiative, which is an ambitious goal to, you know, I forgot I'm supposed to run the camera too. All right, you guys can see me now? All right, good. Um, this is an ambitious goal to create a seamless 2D and 3D geologic map of the entire continent. And we are playing our part in that role by serving up data to help feed this larger initiative. How are we going to do that? Well, this is this initiative actually started a while ago. Uh, back in 2020 was the first endeavor into 3D modeling from a uh, USGS grant perspective, and that was looking at the broad top coal field and how we could model the subsurface. So that was kind of like a test pilot. Uh, we, that was part of a state map grant. We also had beneficiaries of a Great Lakes Geologic Mapping Coalition grant in 2020 that we prepared a digital elevation model of the top of bedrock for the Northwest glaciated portion of Pennsylvania and then followed the next year with a grant to do the whole state. So this talk is gonna show some of the results of those grant funded projects. Let's start with the glaciated portion of Northwest Pennsylvania. Uh, this was done in partnership with Allegheny College and the study looked at compiling borehole data within an eight county area to develop a raster of the bedrock elevation. Um, 
do that, we are blessed with a wealth of well record data. We have, uh, let's see, I have it written down here, 25,000 well records in that area. And those well records contain a observation of depth where bedrock is encountered or not encountered. That would, we're gonna call that a drift well. So a well that penetrates the unconsolidated material but does not hit bedrock, we'll call that a drift well. And then a bedrock well is a, is a well that drills all the way down to or past bedrock elevation. Okay, so we have that, that data. Wait a minute, did someone say data? Yeah, so this is what we can consider like big data analysis. We have all of this, let's, let's pull it together. Uh, it wasn't just well records. We also used some oil and gas well records and some PennDOT geotech borings, whatever we could do to throw at this. But it still begs the question, well, how are we gonna use this big data? Traditionally, this would be done by making contour maps. This is very basic. Listen up, students. This is very basic uh, skills for a, a geologist. And that is to contour out the drift thickness as an isopack, you know, the thickness of uh, the drift <coughs> of the unconsolidated, and to uh, contour out the elevation of bedrock. As you can imagine, this is a very time-consuming uh, method. And but really good at those scales, at, at or I should say, what, what, like a one to 24,000 scale, you can produce some fairly accurate maps. And so this is what has been done. And so one methodology is if we're gonna make a statewide bedrock elevation model, well, all we have to do is create these hand-drawn contours for the whole state, and then oh, look at that, we have a surface. That's not crazy. That's actually what Ohio is doing. They're, they're working in the same initiative we are, and they are taking this approach. They're meticulously contouring out by hand. I mean, computer assisted, but it's still the same process for the whole state. We looked at that and said, you know, that's gonna take forever. <laughs> like, there's still a need for this type of mapping, but if we want it statewide, we gotta come up with a method that can drastically expedite this process. So what if, we take all of those depth to bedrock data points for every one of those well records. And we just put it into, uh, into in this case, it's ARC, uh, ArcGIS, and come up with, all right, well, what is the, let's model the thickness. This is just raw data. And it's kind of splotchy. But this is one of the uh, powers, the superpowers that a geologist needs to have, and that is squinting. So if you look at this and you squint, you can start seeing some trends emerge. So when I look at this data, I see, or now in this case, the dark colors are thick and the light colors are thin. And let's see if I can get a laser pointer here. Okay, so what I see is, hey, look, this is kind of a trend of thickness. This could be a terminal moraine. And we have some valleys here that may be emerging. We have the bluffs uh, along the lake, You're like, okay, there's something going on here, but it's still really messy data. So what if we look at each landform and just do a geostatistical analysis of the thickness within that landform? What emerges? And what we see here is on a qualitative basis, Sure enough, these stream valleys end up being thicker than not stream valleys. And here's our terminal moraines and there's the bluffs. And so we can use, by isolating out these different landforms and the thicknesses that characterize those landforms, we may be able to help our model be a better predictor of thickness. So by using this information to create in the modeling terms, like synthetic points, like where we don't have good density of well data, like what would we put in its place? Well, we could use this to inform uh, what a, if I just drilled here, what do I expect kind of on average, what do I expect a thickness to be? Let's plug that into the model and run through like iterations. And so what we end up with is, all right, it's still splotchy, but you notice those 
those trends are showing up a little better, like the terminal moraines, the valleys, and the bluffs. Like, okay, this is this was um, like a proof of concept. This was more like, what could we do? Because ultimately, we want to get to the whole state. Like, okay, this is working out as to something beneficial. Whoops, here we go. So all we have to do is take that thickness, subtract it from surface topography, and like, okay. So we can end up with a reasonable approximation of the bedrock elevation. We're not done, we gotta scale this up. So that's where, let's look at the whole state. Okay, now we just jumped up. Now we're at like quarter million well data. And again, it's that depth to bedrock that we're really interested in, both you see there's little smatterings of green there. That's a drift well, a well that doesn't penetrate the bedrock. That's still extraordinarily valuable information. So let's run through a similar process of just grading up the thicknesses across the whole state. All right, now we're back to that splotchy map. But what I find interesting about this, again, squinting. You guys practicing? Yes. Let's try squinting on this. And you, what we notice is there are certain, again, landforms. Now we're talking about bigger landforms. These are physiographic sections. And how each landform has its own kind of characteristic of thicknesses. For example, uh, or like here's, here's South Mountain. That jumps out. That's like the first thing that jumps out at me. Is South Mountain really thick? Like, ooh, this is kind of interesting because we just went from a glacial drift to saprolite zones. Ooh, okay, yeah, we're gonna have to because the way the well records are described, we, it talks about when we hit hard bedrock, not really what's above it. So then we end up with, all right, well, from a practical standpoint, like, yeah, saprolite, it's not in the truest sense unconsolidated sediment, but the way it shows up in well records, yeah, it's soft and then you hit harder rock. Um, so sorry, I jumped to the, the hard, the most difficult one first, but some of the other sections you notice how, all right, this on the plateau, fairly thin, don't have a lot of deposits, uh, uh, unconsolidated deposits. So each one of these landform physiographic sections has its own signature. All right, there's something we can work with here, but we're unlike the Northwest Glaciator where we had a lot of data to work with, a high density of data, here we don't have. So we need more helpers. One of those helpers we're gonna use is the topographic position index. Raise your hands, who's ever heard of this? It's a GIS term. You got a couple. All right, well, first let's define it. Okay, it's, it's actually a lot simpler than this graphic makes it out to be. It is, the if you're standing on a on the land on the surface of the land and you have an elevation what is your elevation in relative to everything around you so you take the point that you're interested in and we get an elevation of x called z in this case and then we uh we, we look at the average of a certain radius around that area if your elevation is greater than the average, I bet you're standing on a hill. If your elevation is less than the average, then you're standing in a pit or in a valley. So that simple calculation, we can quantify where you are on a landform. Are you on a ridge? Are you in a valley? Simply by looking at your elevation at a certain location compared to what's around you. You guys with me so far? All right. So why, why do we care? Well, I'm looking for ways to characterize, like we all know intuitively that the thickness of unconsolidated sediments vary whether you're in a valley or you're on top of a ridge or you know where you are on the land form is going to dictate how much you know, the thickness of an unconsolidated material you expect. Take every one of those quarter of a million wells and I assign each one of those data points a TPI value, okay? So, uh, and then I'm going to, for each section, each physiographic section, I'm going to compare that to see how does 
observed thickness compared to TPI. All right, so let's use let's use uh, Waynesburg Hills down here because we don't have a lot of data there, so we need a lot of help. So if I plot up depth to bedrock versus TPI, and then make our categorizations of the different land, whether you're on a slope or you're in the valley. Okay, it's still messy data, but I'm getting somewhere in terms of what's the like the average, just like we did before, where we looked at each. Uh, I'm I'm really looking at what what's the average thickness for each one of these sections, but more importantly, based on TPI. I have to admit, when I was doing this, like I I don't think this is going to work. But when I plotted it up, something interesting happened. We love it when something interesting happens, and that is. Just based on that analysis through the whole state, now looking at this hypothetical thickness, going from dark colors is thick, light colors is thin, based on each section, well, some interesting patterns emerge. And things like when you're in the glaciated, like you know, look, those are the valleys, they stand out nicely as being thick sediment. And in the plateau region, you have most of your unconsolidated is in uh, valley fill formations. So it's in the valleys. Okay, cool. When we get into, well, oh, there's, there's South Mountain, really thick. You got to deal with the sapper light there. But what's interesting is if you just look at the streams, knowing that dark color is, is thick, light color is thin. Here we have deposits inside the stream valleys. But notice when you get down lower, we are now in situations where streams are not depositing a lot. It's where we're cutting, you know, like in the Susquehanna and other places where you know, we could walk across the Susquehanna and you're walking on bedrock, you know. So it's starting to predict things that we observe through our understanding of, of, of geologic or geomorphic processes. Um, I have to say the, the the kicker in this, where we realize, oh, we we might be onto something, is when you know what you do, you you play around with data, you look for anomalous points, things that stand out. There was a really thick prediction, not a not a real observation point, but a prediction of a really thick deposit in our coastal plain. You know, we have a very small coastal plain, but we do have some in Pennsylvania. And we're looking at, it, it's like, well, that can't be right. It's like it's just sticking out there for no reason. Here it was a landfill. So like, oh, it this this little surrogate model just predicted the landfill because the fact that you have this big hump there that shouldn't be there, that must be all fill material. Okay, we'll call it that. So like, all right, I think we got something that we can at least as a starting point. So now refining the interpolated sediment thickness, but this time using our surrogate model, which is based on the TPI, which is based on each uh, uh, the each section, each uh, physiographic section, we end up with a closer approximation of what we think the, bed, the, the unconsolidated thickness across the state is. Is it exactly right on? Uh, is it a perfect prediction? No, but we're getting closer. And that's the key here is I, I wanted to focus on a methodology, a reproducible methodology that we could keep running as we get better information, as we get more data, and not be reliant on hand contouring or manual processes that are very time consuming and would have to be redone every time we got new important information. So this was going through, all right, how can we get there using math, and knowing that it's going to get better as we get more data. So now that we have this thickness, easy. All we have to do is subtract it from the land surface and we have our bedrock surface, right? No problem, except if you do that, all of the little, you know, little features, drainage features or whatever on the surface is going to be imprinted on our bedrock model. So little stream gullies and all that stuff is, is just going to come out like, well, we don't want that. So this was actually a, a you know, paper or a study that was done 
before and talking to Dave Soller, he turned me on to this idea. He's like, you know, you probably need to do some smoothing. I was like, yeah, but what if I have zero thickness? I don't want any smoothing because zero thickness means bedrock is exposed to the surface. That means the actual topography is the bedrock surface. So we created a conditional smooth, not we created, I mean, we, we took it off of <laughs> so Soller and Garrity kind of started it. We're like, oh, how are we gonna apply it for our area? And that is we apply a greater degree of smoothing when the thickness is high and zero smoothing when the thickness is zero. So then we can end up with a bedrock elevation DEM. Kind of looks like surface topography at this scale, um, but it's, it's our first cut on how we can get at this surface quickly with the data we have and be able to reproduce it even quicker if we get new data. This was only done on water well records. So we can start putting in all kinds of empirical data. That's the important thing is I don't want any interpretive data yet because I want this to this model to be able to guide interpretations. So we're looking at using empirical data of any kind. I'd love to get my hands, where's PennDOT? I would love to get my hands on more PennDOT geo, geotech data uh, because the more data we put into this model, the better the results are gonna be. So again, I was going more on a methodology than a result. The results I think are serviceable, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, put money on it. <laughs> and you said, okay, great, but how are we gonna see this? Hey, do you guys know about PA geode? This is my, our, our, our mid-break uh, uh, plug, a commercial for PA geode. <coughs> so one of the new enhancements, and there's more on the way, and keep checking back, we're adding new stuff all the time, is that now if you click on, here we are, located right here off of, off of uh, uh, 283, you know, if you click on that, you would get the formation, the age, and oh, look at this, we're also gonna put in bedrock elevation. The expected range where we would, we would find bedrock elevation if we drilled a well right here. Pretty cool, huh? More applause, but all right, that's okay. I was, I was hoping for spontaneous applause. No, <laughs> uh, but uh, as we were saying, keep checking PA Geo. We got some cool stuff on there. If you haven't been on there in a while, check it out. We also have our water wells and spring data, and we're making enhancements all the time. All right, uh, doing good on time. Part two, <laughs> or two of three. No, okay. Um, and that is landslide risk. So we're gonna we're gonna take this into a whole nother direction, but it's still gonna involve data and statistical analysis, which is what, what I enjoy. And you know, Allegheny County's got some landslide problems. Uh, and and why is that? Well, we know it's a it's a fundamentally it's a geologic issue. It, it's a geologic reason. And we could go into that those reasons today, but that's not me. I'm not a landslide geologist. Uh, we we have we have in the survey we have landslide uh, expert. I'm looking at it more from a data standpoint because what I want to know is how can we improve this map? Because if if we are serving this to uh, municipal planners and people making decisions about housing developments, this is somewhat helpful or <laughs> it's it's accurate but maybe not all that useful uh, because if you're in the Waynesburg Hills section yeah you're just SOL and there you go so what can do about that well what we're going to do is uh, when Helen Delano left the survey she handed me a, a database of 600 landslides within Allegheny County like, ooh, we gotta do something with that. I'm not exactly sure what, but we should because you know, someone say data. Like, all right, good. Let's let's do something. Uh, so the first thing is let's look at each one of those landslide occurrence points and how it matches up to. This is a slope raster. 
So the light colors represent really steep slopes and the dark colors is black as flat. All right, so each one of these landslide locations, if I identify what was the slope of that, I can do a histogram of that. Okay, cool. Um, I like probability density functions because they're, you can do more with them. So this is the probability density function based on that histogram. And what it tells you conclusively is that landslides occur at peaks at 30 degrees of a slope. And as the slope increases, your likelihood of a landslide occurring decreases. How about that? Now that's not, that doesn't feel right at all. But that's what this is saying. Because look, there are so few landslides that occur at steep slopes. Okay, I'm, I'm missing something here because that, that doesn't sound right at all. So what if I take another 600 randomly generated points? Mm, let's do that again and again. So I have three data sets in the red, orange, yellow, 600 randomly generated points in Allegheny County and let's plot up the probability density function of slope. Okay, so now what I have is, this is where landslides occur, the histogram of slope of landslide occurrence, and this is just a randomly generated set. So what we find is most of Allegheny County is of low slope and very little of it is high slope, which is why we have less landslides occurring at high slope, follow me? So, what we really want to look at is the ratio of these two lines. So this ratio would be really small. This would be one, and this would be greater than one. Okay, uh, let's graph it. Okay, so for slope, so here's our ratio of landslide occurrence to a random control set is really small. And then we go up and eventually you end up, this is two times, uh, 10 times more likely than the average. Okay. So now we're getting to something that may be a predictor. I, I know this isn't revolutionary. Of course, steeper slopes, slopes are gonna have more landslide occurrence, but it's more proving out a mathematical representation of something we know intuitively. So if I just look at the range of one tenth to 10, and color code that. So this raster here, the, the red colors represent where the slope at which landslide occurrence is more common than, yeah, than a randomly generated set, you know, than the average. And one tenth would be black. That's where we don't expect landslides to occur based on slope. Okay, I know there wasn't wasn't anything revolutionary, but now what if I apply that exact same mathematical formula to other data sets. I don't know, let's pick elevation. So, huh, isn't that interesting? In Allegheny County, most of the landslides occur at a certain range of elevation. Well, because that, that's where this, the, the valley walls are. So, okay, that's something. What about topographic position index? We just talked about that. And here we have that landslide occurrence is more likely on slopes, not in valleys, not in ridges, and not in flat areas. Okay, good. How about depth to bedrock? I just created that depth to bedrock map. What if I did that same analysis? Notice how it all came out white? That's because you no, know, there was nothing about that data that really stood out to say landslide occurrence happens more often in this data in this data range. Okay, that's important because what you'll see later is whenever you multiply something by one, nothing happens. So this was actually a good thing to get. Yeah, this is really not that big of a factor. How about available water storage and soil? Again, I'm just throwing rasters at this process to see what shows up. Like, okay, interesting. There might be, there might be some correlation. Now, mind you, we are talking about correlation here. This is not causation. Uh, this is more a matter of, I want to create a predictive tool that where, where landslides do occur, where do we expect them to occur in other similar conditions? I'll let Stephanie worry about the trigger mechanisms and the, the amount of moisture actually in the, in the soil and all these other factors. This is just looking at gross scale, where, where would I go to look to find 
uh, sinkholes. So here's canopy height. I was really disappointed in that one. I thought maybe vegetation would have some factor. Really think the resolution of this raster set that I used for canopy height didn't bear anything out. So I'm going to try it at uh, you know, finer resolutions like using LIDAR, first returns, something like that. So that's something I'm going to play with. How about distance from a mapped geologic contact? Would that mean anything? Actually, there's a little bit of a correlation there. How about distance from a mapped fold axis? Huh. Okay. None of these by themselves mean anything. But what if I smush them all together? What if I multiply each raster by the other one? Now, remember, if there was no correlation, you're just multiplying by one. You did nothing. Great. No problem. But if there is a correlation, if there is something there, then it should bear out as I multiply all this through. So now I have my first step at a landslide. Like, where would I expect to find them? Well, those would be in the, the red areas. If I zoom in, like, okay, if we can find the right rasters, and this is where Stephanie and I are going to work and find out what's the best combination of rasters to get to something usable. Because wouldn't it be great if city planners had a map like this when they make their decisions on de housing developments? So we give them a little more information than just saying, hey, you're in our landside risk area. And not just simply looking at slope. Slope's important. There's got to be other factors involved that we could glean out. Okay. Again, no spontaneous applause. Okay, well, <laughs> um, when I gave this talk in uh, GSA Pittsburgh, they just went nuts for it. But I think they just liked that I was calling out the city. You know, <laughs> anyone here from Pittsburgh? <laughs> All right, let's talk about 3D modeling. So this is kind of a state of the nation, you know, state of the survey. Where are we? Well, we're under construction. Awesome. So we have plans on making a three-dimensional model, a geologic model of the whole state by 2030. And how are we going to approach that? Well, we're going to do it step by step. <laughs> so the first step was this bedrock model. Okay, I'm taking a little leap here, but I'm just going to call that the basis of Cenozoic. I know it's not really, but this methodology could be used to create a, okay, let's Let's take all the unconsolidated sediments. That's that's one layer. All right, and then we also have basement. Now this is work done in uh, Penn State, uh, Duff's uh, o, uh, Gold and all uh, 05, and some recent stuff looking at seismic reflection <laughs> uh, still being done in Penn State. Like okay. And, and I made this intentionally fuzzy. Don't don't look too closely at it. This is still still a work in progress. But I have the bread to my sandwich. I have top of bedrock and I have top of basement. Okay, that, relatively that was the easy part. Now we got to get to the hard part. Oh yeah, and don't look in southeastern Pennsylvania either. That's uh, that gets funny. Like. I put basement in quotes because I think that's an interesting discussion. Like, what is a basement? But anyway, we can we can have that philosophical discussion <laughs> before we uh, before we finalize the surface. So, uh, taking the major unconformities, we're talking about the Cenozoic. How about the Mesozoic? So, this is what we're doing right now. Uh, we have a state map grant. It's currently active. We're working on it right now to pull out any data that we can on where the base of the Mesozoic exists. We're actually going to use some of Harrisburg University students to help us digitize. We have like 60 cross sections that go across the bounding fault of the, the Mesozoic base. It's a starting point. Uh, you know, it's something, all right, well, let's start framing this out. We also have a seismic line that we're acquiring over here. So maybe, we don't know yet, we haven't seen it, but maybe that will give us some indication of where the base of the Mesozoic Basin exists. But what we're going to do is start gathering the data. Everything, you know, 
looking at things as X, Y, and Z data points. I know where the base, I know where the bounding fault is here and X and Y, what's at Z, let's start digitizing it. Uh, once we get that data, I'm not sure what we're gonna do with it yet, but that's the first step because we gotta know where the surfaces lie in order to try to model it. Okay, so let's, what's next? You know, if we got, it, let's say we get the bases of Mesozoic. Well, then I wanna work on the Allegheny front. That's actually part of our state map right now is we're digitizing some old cross sections. So the plan here is start creating a framework. Take the major surfaces, things that we know with some degree of certainty, <laughs> not a high degree of certainty, but we know we know they exist. We know the Allegheny front is a thing. What does it do at depth? How do what do we do with those values? And start framing out the like boxing in the whole state in order to start filling in the complicated bits all like that. <laughs> but saving that to last, let's start with the easy surfaces first. So that everything eventually is going to go in PA geode. Do you guys have that bookmark yet? Okay, good. Um, so the grand vision, so when we're having this talk five years from now, we're going to be talking about go to PA geode and you'll be able to slice through and see some of these surfaces, geologic units in a real time or not real time, but on demand cross section view. That's our vision. That's where we want to go. And I will report on that as we get more information. So uh, that concludes my rambling. We have built in time for questions. Yeah, plenty of time. Because <laughs> that's where the fun stuff is. Because, you know, I just start rambling on. I don't, I don't know if you guys. Yeah. No. Can we go back to sure. the thickness map for the state? Yes. A long way. There. Yeah, that. Um, you pointed at South Mountain and said uh, it looks like one of the thicker places, right? Yeah. But I thought I heard you say the thick stuff is on the mountain. Is that right? Well, it's the saprolytic zones. I, I, I only brought it up as that South Mountain kind of gives a, ooh, there's a, there's a discrepancy between but sediment thicknesses. I'm and, looking at many well records yeah. in the valley, in Cumberland County, Franklin County. The thick materials are at the base of South Mountain. Yeah, which would be right here, right? On the north side. Yep, and that is where we do see the thick. feet in places. That's right. And incidentally, I could sometime give you uh, at least a couple dozen well records from where the glass plant is, the Tootie to Mount Holly. And now a different question. Yeah. Uh, where you had a map of, I guess it would the Great Valley with just one green bulb. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is, so this was a topographic position index. So the Great Valley would be, uh, well, so here's what's deceptive here. Let me uh, back up here. This is scale dependent. So notice how a TPI calculation right here, when you look at an average, would give one value, like this would actually be a ridge. But then if you broaden and made a larger radius, then this would end up being a valley. See, so it's uh, this depiction of TPI is not entirely accurate because we really want it more zoomed in to see the definition you know, the different scale. I'm surprised that we don't see a little bit of difference between 
the carbonates and the shale. See, and that's what would show up if I did it at a, at, a, at a finer resolution. What I'm showing here is notice how each of the different physiographic sections has its own color um, theme. <laughs> you know, like it, it's, it has a characteristic. But yet, you're absolutely right. If we zoomed in, and not just zoomed in, but ran the analysis at a finer scale, then the definition of the of the different lithology, they pop. TPI is, I think, a very valuable tool for doing a landform <coughs> analysis. And it's, um, but the challenge is you have to do it at multiple scales, in a sca resolutions, let's say. And I'll, I'll just one more comment. <laughs> I, I bet your your computer analysis went nuts in the car scales. <laughs> yes. It's very all over the place. Exactly. And that's where we're never going to get out of the splotchiness that is this map. Because the, we have, as we, we all know, you can drill in one area, especially in carbonates, you drill 50 feet away, 25 feet away, and you get a completely different because you know, whether you hit a fracture or, or, yeah. So that's the beauty of doing things at this scale is that it's, uh, we can wave, I can wave my arms and talk about, it. you know, it's not, it's, we're not zeroing in. This is not meant to be a um, site specific. In fact, the DEM that we generated from this analysis is a hundred meters. And that was about as small as I could make the cell size and still felt like I was doing something, you know, like value. But if I went any finer than that, it's like, yeah, well. Thank you. And also, which explains why when you go to PAGO right now, I'm listing a range of values, uh, right? Uh, Cause that's actually our 90% error range, which is really large. Uh, my intent, or my hope is as we get more data, as we refine the process, I can start tightening that, that error bar. You have a question online? Yeah, there are a few questions online. I also mentioned that there may be some wells that you don't have access to. What if I have wells that you don't have access to? And I call it to say that your model is wrong. <gasps> Not the data that proves it. I love it when people say that. That is one of my favorite things mm -hmm. because uh, the best way to get information is to put out wrong <laughs> or information based on wrong data. Because then, yeah. If, so I welcome it. If someone says, no, that's all wrong, like, yeah, because it's only as good as the data I have. And if I don't have your data, it's not going to, it's not going to bear that out. So. My answer to uh, anyone who says that is, hey, bring it on. Because it, again, I, I created the process to be able to ingest data rapidly, easily, and the more data, the better the model is going to be. Okay, so from online, Will asks, is the RASPI algorithm that you publicly available for download? That is a wonderful question, and yes, it is. So it is currently available for download on, on POSDA, on the POSDA site. And it's actually what's driving that identified tool on PA Geode. Um, we thought about hosting it or, or serving it up ourselves. And we're like, you know, POSDA is going to do it. Hey, thanks, POSDA. Like, you guys can do it. And uh, that way we're not duplicating storage space. So yes, it is available for download. If we have important links, you can put it in the description if you'd like, and we'll put it up on YouTube. Excellent. Yes, let's do that. Okay. Oh, and Will says, just got it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Real time. Robert asks, uh, does your study suggest that soils would be thick or thin on Elk Mountain and Lake So, yeah, now going back to that, uh, to Noel's question. Oh, man. Who's um, South Mountain, we talked about that, but it also shows up in the Reading Prom. And that's why I immediately jumped to, oh, this is saprolite. Yes, and in the Reading Prom, it would be on top of the hills you know, where you have your, your big spongy areas uh, as, the, as the, the granitic gneiss 
weathers. So that is, you know, I, I, and I, I felt the need to point it out because I keep calling this sediment deposits. And, hey, it's not. <laughs> it's some, in some cases, it's chemical weathering. So that's something we got to tease out. How do we differentiate? And I'm sure we can, but that's just more data manipulation to, to figure out, well, what's really a deposited, unconsolidated unit and what's a weathering component? Because drillers, they don't care. Sorry if there's any drillers online. They, they, they just feel like it's soft and then it's hard. <laughs> Kent. A couple questions. Yeah. You mentioned Ohio is hand drawing everything. How about Jersey and Maryland? Oh, I try not to talk to those people. No, I, I, I don't know. Um, I just recently saw Ohio give a presentation very similar to mine, except it was basing their models on the on the topo, or yeah, on the contour lines. Now I find that an important distinction. I want to keep my empirical data only because the whole idea is like we can have this to inform an interpretation. But as soon as you put an interpreted line into a model, it's baked in. You, then it's really hard to change that interpretation. So we're so those hand drawn maps. Um, we're actually still doing it. There's there's a there's an important like it's a valuable mapping service. So we're still doing it. But now what we're doing is we're running the model as a guide. So it kind of speeds the process along. It's not going to deliver. A product, but at least it will help the hand contouring and guiding. Well, based on this analysis, it should look something like this one. But you need to put in the geologic interpretation of no, this is a buried valley, and it really should look like this. And so there's still a need for this this hand drawn um, contouring, but I want to use this model to help. But one other question. Yeah, it might, it might just be coincidence, but you're. Uh, your landslide analysis sure looked like a rock or soil failure graph. You know, that one that had like the plastic. Oh, interesting. Brittle failure, uh, it may just be a, a coincidence. That's an interesting, we'll have to explore that a little more. We, we are a part of our endeavors and, and sometime soon, Stephanie's going to be giving a presentation to HAGS about some of the work that we are looking, using statistical analysis, using slope failure, using other tools that we want to develop in terms of understanding the mechanics of landslides a little better. That was it, Ken? Okay. <laughs> Mike. So um, I have two questions. So um, has there been any thought about using any of Esri's very preliminary AI tools. Yes. <laughs> Setting me up perfectly. Yes. Uh, the future is machine learning. Um, and it's one of those we don't have anything to report on yet. We just uh, got the license for image analyst. And we're going to start playing with that to see where it can be used to help help some of this, especially, you know, it, it it's never, you know, I'm going to wax philosophically about AI. It's never going to replace us as geologists, but it can speed things up. If we can inform, if we can teach it to look for certain things, USGS is doing some amazing stuff in glacial uh, identification of glacial deposits using machine learning. So it, there's definitely potential. Uh, we're in its infancy as a, as a discipline. Red's infancy, so we're like, oh, we want in on this game, see how we can do it. So, yeah, stay tuned. Second, and I, I don't actually know the area of Pittsburgh terribly well, so this might be maybe ridiculous, but there was a recent landslide on Beaver Ray Road over there that was in the news recently. I didn't know that happened to fall within the realm that you were looking at. Didn't, I didn't check that. Need to do some model validation. Yeah. <laughs> John. Uh, from what I over the years have noticed, uh, some of the landslide landslides are aggravated by man-made structures. How the heck do you tie that into your model? Yeah, and see, I want to I want to stay uh, separate from that because if and the reason is is I'm looking at the 
if I'm going to give a decision maker tools on where they should or should not or how development should occur. So it's really a matter of before the urban disturbance is where I want to look. I know it's difficult because one of the one of the things like running that analysis, if I do a, a that same you saw how I did the distance from a contact, a map geologic contact, if I do the same analysis but distance from a road, it's a perfect correlation because most landslides happen along roads or near roads. Yeah, but but don't like I want the conditions that would be more likely to a landslide to occur before you cut into it, before the road is put in place. You have to subtract out a lot of the actual landslide occurrences that are man-made. Um, no, not necessarily. It's a matter of which parameters I'm in, um, of examining, I want to make sure they're not anthropogenic in nature. The the raster image itself. Here, uh, re getting into statistics here. Uh, but you notice how I had some of those rasters that was all white, and I was like, great, that's what I wanted. I wanted something that shows, okay, this is what a no correlation would look like. So when I was dreaming up something, like what could I put in as a factor that just couldn't possibly have any relationship to to a landslide. One of the first thing is like, how about distance to a church? Yeah, okay, that should have no, bit. oh my goodness, it was a, that was a really good correlation because it goes back to the urbanization. I, like churches exist where there's development built up, landslides occur where there's development. So I had to stay away from any kind of anthropogenic uh, data. Does that make sense? Even though, yeah, you wanna know where landslides are gonna occur? It's on that, on that road cut right there. Of course it is. That's not the question. Oh, I want to say, what are the natural conditions that would lead it to occur? That's easy. Pittsburgh red beds. Yeah. You get them wet, they just fall apart. Yeah. Color red. Okay, color red. Uh, your landslide data in Allegheny, is that all uh, just raster based? Which one? No, 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 no. Uh, the data points themselves? No, the raster, raster, math, raster math involved. Oh, yeah. Right. It was all raster math to get to it. Yeah. Okay. Um, no point data. Well, but see, the starting point was the point data. Okay. So those points, that 600 points that I started with, those were all observed okay. landslides, okay. not calculated, not predicted, or anything like they were. There was actually a confirmed landslide that occurred at that location. Had, did you compare it to any of the stuff that uh, Pomeroy, was Pomeroy, did the landslide? Seven and a half there. No, I did not look at that. This is purely based on on Helen's uh, inventory, okay. which spans, I think, a hundred years worth of data. Okay. Not that she personally collected it. You may want to look at those seven and a half that are. Well, and and sure, and again, my my, I want to come up with a process. So going forward, uh, oh yeah, there's lots of things we can do, like. Uh, Stephanie's going to embark on a landslide inventory of the Catawissa quad. And once she gathers that data, then we could run some of this analysis. Like even, even though the data I used was in Allegheny County, only because I had the data. And but the analysis should be able to be used, not the results. Like I can't take the Allegheny predictors and apply that anywhere else outside of Allegheny County, but I could run those same analysis, same rasters in a different area and see what emerges. Cool. Well, you guys made it through uh, an hour of statistics and boring stuff. <laughs> they, 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 oh. <laughs> I did my darndest to stay on time. So that's why I was talking about it. So if there's no more questions, then we can uh, adjourn the meeting. And uh, I'm trying to stop sharing. There we go. Um, and don't forget, next uh, March, we have uh, Jesse Thornburg from Temple University. He's coming in. Um, the uh, PDH credit certificates, look for them over the next three days or so. If everything's working right, you should get them. And if you're not, let me know. Nothing else? All right. Thanks. Have a great evening.